events. It's wonderful to know that there are library members from all across the state joining us this evening. Sit back and relax, but if you have a question for our authors this evening, then please feel free to add it to the Q&A box and we'll get to audience questions towards the end of the event. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which each of us are on. I'm on Darawal country. I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other First Nation people. I celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. My name is Monique Akawola and I work for Sutherland Shire Libraries. And it's my pleasure to introduce Meg Keneally in conversation with Lauren Chater to discuss Lauren's latest novel, Gulliver's Wife. Megan Chater, oh, I beg your pardon, Lauren Chater writes historical fiction with a particular focus on women's stories and is the author of the best-selling historical novel, The Lace Weaver and the baking compendium, Well Read Cookies, Beautiful Biscuits Inspired by Great Literature. Meg Keneally is the author of Fled and The Wreck and co-author with her father, Tom, of the Montserrat series of historical crime novels. If you have any questions for our authors, please put them in the Q&A box. We will endeavour to get all audience questions. Please include the name of your local library so we know where you're from. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Gulliver's Wife, you can do so at your local bookshop or online from Booktopia. So I'd just like to welcome Meg Keneally and Lauren Chater to our event. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Thank you very much. Uh, really happy to be here to discuss uh, this absolutely gorgeous book. Um, which I adored so much that I gave it a cover quote. Uh, Lauren, congratulations. <laughs> it's Very absolutely generous. wonderful. And before we get going, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which each of us are on. I'm on Guy Magal country and paid my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and but for those of you who don't know anything about Gulliver's Wife, this is the extraordinary tale of the woman behind the hero of uh, Dean Swift's um, work, Gulliver's Travels. And I suppose the first thing I'd love to know, Lauren, is why, what drew you to Gulliver and what made you think, hmm, I wonder if there's more to this story? Mm, it's a really good question. Um, I'm just going to start a little uh, presentation so that as I'm talking, people can see uh, a bit of a visual, which might be a little bit more interesting for them. Um, and then I will answer your question. So here it is. Um, I first came up with the idea of uh, Gulliver's Wife when I was working in my local library, which just happens to be the one that I'm <laughs> sitting in today and um, talking to you from uh, Sutherland Library uh, in the Sutherland Shire. Um, I was putting the books away and I, I decided that I would give myself a challenge. Like I always like a challenge when I'm reading, I challenge myself with something that I haven't read before or, um, or to reread something uh, that I missed because there are always so many good books and you never get a chance, even when you're in a library, working in a library to read them all. Um, so I started reading all the books in the section titled A Thousand and One Books to Read Before You Die. Mm -hmm. And one of the books that I reread was Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Now, Gulliver's Travels is uh, the story of Lemuel Gulliver, who is a sailor surgeon who goes off to sea um, and has all these incredible adventures um, and meets fantastical creatures, including the tiny Lilliputians, um, little people who are uh, brokering war with their neighbours. Sounds quite familiar, really, um, <laughs> in terms of polit political um, parties. It, it was actually a, a satire and he was... Um, making commentary about uh, the English and their, you know, um, avarice and their desire to sort of uh, colonise constantly. Um, but in the actual story, um, Gulliver uh, returns home after um, having adventures. So he returns home four times and each time he does, um, his wife is always waiting for him. And uh, so to me, I, as I was reading, rereading it as um, an adult, I decided that I wanted to know more about the mysterious Mary Gulliver um, and to understand why, um, why, what it might have been like for the women that were left behind during this time period when they were um, sort of had to run their own households and, and support themselves and support their children as well. It would have been a really, really tough job. Um, and so um, so I started doing research into, into sort of women of the time period. But I also tried to incorporate um, a lot of um, little references to uh, Gulliver's travels as I was writing. Yeah, so that's where the idea really, really came from for me. 
Fantastic. And and Mary is a really fascinating character. And one of the things I really love writing about and reading about are women who step up to positions of leadership in societies which don't particularly welcome that. Um, and certainly the England uh, in your story is one of those societies. And Mary is a midwife, which puts her sometimes at odds with the male medical fraternity. Um, why did you decide to make her a midwife? Um, look, I was doing a lot of research around the time period um, and this whole idea of a midwives um, being these, uh, there was the sort of this preconception um, of midwives being these ignorant um, women from the country that they knew nothing, um, that they just sort of got lucky um, when they were birthing children. But actually the, the truth when I started to dig deeper into it was that they were um, highly educated women and they had a really incredible training system. Um, the midwives of London um, were uh, these sort of uh, risk takers but they and pioneers, um, which I had never, I'd never really known that side of the story. Yeah. Um, and a woman called Dr. Doreen Evenden did a, a PhD, did a thesis on uh, these women. And she did a lot of research at the British Library and she unearthed all their names for the first time. And I just thought that was incredibly exciting. Um, and I wanted to write the story of those women who had um, sort of stood up against the patriarchy of the time and, mm. and claimed that status for themselves. Um, and they, they had a midwife's oath that they had to swear. So they had to swear that they would do no harm to uh, the babies and, mm. the, um, and the mothers um, and that they would enact no witchcraft, which I also thought was very interesting that yeah. there was this, yeah, this idea that maybe, you know, that they would want to harm, um, they would want to harm their clients, um, mm. which is where this whole uh, idea of the gossips came from, the women who were... Um, witnesses to the birth so if you gave birth in the 17th century you would um, have a group of women come and watch watch the proceedings which just sounds com completely horrible to us now yeah. <laughs> no sense of privacy at all yeah. um yeah but that was um you know that was the times and so yeah so I just wanted to write a little bit about uh, that side of it and also my my mother is a midwife oh wow. um yeah and so um seeing that other side of it I think that was something that I was interested in exploring um because mm. I think midwives do a really uh, fantastic job and it's often a, they're like often unsung heroes as well um yeah. we don't really appreciate that job until we're in you know our real moment of need yes yes yeah <laughs> and then they're the most important people in the world aren't they so. yeah absolutely and it's really interesting that you mentioned witchcraft because I mean that's a um that's an accusation that's been levelled against inconvenient women or women who are seen to be a bit too uppity and not know their place yes. throughout history. Exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, I would imagine that there, that in some cases the line between midwifery and what the patriarchy saw as witchcraft at the time would have been quite a thin one. Were they ever accused of witchcraft? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a lot more prevalent in regional areas. Um, yeah. It didn't happen so often in London. There was only, I think, one or two cases where they were actually convicted of um, of being witches. Um, mm. And and there would have been co-morbid, um, you know, things that went along with that. Yeah. Um, they would have been maybe, they wouldn't have had protection, you know, so they might have been poor, poorer women um, and or not, or, un, or widows, you know, so they didn't have the protection of a, of a man to support them. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely it happened a lot more in, in the regional areas. And I think that's why it was so important for them to have those witnesses because yeah. the witnesses could testify and say, no, you know, this, um, it was, if you lost a baby, it was just an unfortunate act. So it was an act of God kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they also, their, their job was also to baptize the children um, because often, you know, the babies passed away um, before they could be christened. Um, yes. They didn't want them either going to the Catholic side because yes. they were Protestants in England um, and they didn't want them to be stuck in purgatory as well. So that was like a very important job for the midwives. That's really interesting. That, that's yeah. fascinating because that's obviously taking what would have been considered a solely male authority. How did the church feel about that? Yeah, well, they um, they were the ones that were in control of it. So they, they had to, it was an ecclesiastical uh, kind of position 
So the church, I think that that the way that they got around it was that they they had the ultimate. Um, well, they got, and they got paid. <laughs> they had the ultimate say over what the women could and couldn't do. They weren't allowed to use um, instruments. They were only allowed to use their hands. They weren't allowed to use any surgical kind of things because that was the surgeon's um, domain. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, yeah, the church took a fee. So you would pay you would pay your licensing fees. Um, and so that was obviously worthwhile for them to yeah. uh, to take that. Mm. Uh, that's that that that's that's really interesting. I'm just reading on the screen about Mary Tops rabbit. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit distracting, <laughs> isn't it? Mary Tops rabbit. It's fascinating. Why don't if, if if people haven't had a chance to read what's on the screen, just give us a quick thumbnail sketch of Mary Tops rabbits, and we'll yeah yeah I'll I'll put it. It's on my Facebook page. Oh, okay, my Facebook so, page, so you can read it. Look. But Mary Mary Toft was a a woman in the 17th century who claimed that she had given birth to rabbits. And all these, uh, she managed to trick all the surgeons, the most renowned surgeons in in England, and they all came around to visit her. And then it turned out that her and her husband had just concocted this big hoax. Um, and she actually got convicted and she went to prison, you know, because yeah, she, they charged. Of course they did. Pretending to charge people to come and see <laughs> rabbit babies. So, so if you were a midwife in that period, you were exposing yourself to the potential of actually you know, running foul of the law or running foul of the of, of, of the church. Do you think, um, uh, did, did that, did you fold that into Mary's character, that that potential danger? Yeah, I wanted, um, I wanted it to be, to that tension to be present, that mm-hmm. um, even though these women did have um, some agency and some power, that there was always a line. There was always a line that they couldn't cross. So they had to be quite yeah. subversive, I think, about, um about the kind of um, the extent of what they they tried to achieve. Um, so there were things that they could do that were in the realms of what they could do, and things that that obviously were completely inappropriate, like using the um, the surgical instruments and things like that. It was quite yeah. dangerous um, for them. But um, the the surgeons' guild were extremely um, powerful. They were extremely powerful, and so for them to come up against uh, against the midwives um you know that was quite a clash um for them and before the um before the forceps were invented there wasn't really the opportunity for um the surgeons to enter the chamber because it was considered a women's area childbirth um but once the forceps were invented in the 16 um 1640s and 1650s and then sold as a patent in the later half of the century um the surgeons were suddenly had access to all this um yeah to all this business that they'd never had before uh and so it became a real kind of power struggle between the surgeons and the um and the midwives and the midwives wow so mary um as the novel opens we see her at her at her work and she believes at that point at the opening of the novel that she's a widow doesn't she uh, yes, she does. And then she suddenly finds out she isn't. She does. <laughs> and uh, it throws a hand grenade into the middle of her world. Yeah. Um, how does she feel about Lemuel's sudden reappearance? Yeah, I, I imagine that this was the situation that happened quite a lot back then because it was a time when we didn't have, um, we didn't have email, you know, we didn't have um social media or any or we, we they didn't even have letters they had letters but it would take so long for a letter to yeah. come from you know the east indies or jakarta or whenever wherever the men were mm. sailing men were um to reach london that a lot of the times there were across um messages so you would potentially arrive home and find that your spouse had married yeah. someone else which i can imagine would have been a real tizzy to try and untangle yes um but so poor Mary um, thinks that she has sort of escaped this without giving too many spoilers, without um, making it too obvious to think that she has uh, escaped this marriage that she doesn't didn't feel comfortable with in, anymore. And then to find out that uh, suddenly her world is turned upside down because her husband has suddenly returned and she's built a life for herself in his absence um, and then discovers that... Um, you know, she actually is a wife again and she has all these responsibilities um, to him, but also to her daughter, Bess, who has sort of worships him 
Uh, so it does it does really throw a spanner in the works for Paul Mary, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, and and I want to talk about Bess in a minute. She's a yes. she's an amazing character too. But first of all, um, your Gulliver, um, uh, the the way you've written Lemuel, he tends to absorb all the oxygen in a room, doesn't he? He tends to command a, a a lot of attention, but at the same time, he's he's haunted by his own his own demons um, uh, and is sometimes debilitated by them. Mm. What kind of, what were you think? how were you thinking of him as a character? Were you thinking that he was perhaps, uh, he had some sort of form of, of mental illness or um, were you thinking that, uh, and there are hints towards the end of the novel that perhaps he's not raving after all when he talks about mm. tiny little creatures. So in your mind, is he delu- was he d- delusional? Was he hallucinating, or was he a true explorer? I think it's really, yeah, it's really hard. I didn't want to make it completely obvious in the story. Mm. I wanted to leave a little bit of ambiguity there. Yeah. Um, but I think in my mind, he certainly um, was delusional, or he he has an addiction, and so um, you know that impinges on his. Um, mm. his sense of reality um, but there were lots of things that strange things that people believed in you yes. know back in the 17th century um, it was a time of real um, enlightenment but at the same time there were all these superstitions that people mm. believed in um, and so I think it would have been quite difficult to define what we would call reality now um, because yeah. we we think we, I mean, but even now we live in a post-truth world. How hard is it to, yes. uh, yeah, to work out what the truth is of something when we have so much media um, saturation? And so mm. I don't know that it's completely different. Um, but I think that he, yeah, he's, he's kind of a weak character. And I know that people love Lemuel Gulliver. They love him as a character. Um, and so I knew I'd be taking a risk yes. <laughs> offending um, some people who really I always felt connected to him uh, when they were children and as this character. And I loved Gulliver's Travels as a child too. Yeah. I loved the story. But that's just his um, point of view. And so this is Mary's story. So I thought, you know, I have to give her her due and let her uh, tell it the way that she would have seen it from a woman's perspective. And I think a lot of the time he is, he's not an evil character, but he's just yeah. a bit weak. And he's, he's also uh, emblematic of, men at that time period as well that um you know they were just they were entitled and they were they were in charge um and so and he was a surgeon as well so you know he was getting a a decent amount of money um yeah so I don't know I don't know that I want to give too much of it away but he he certainly struggles with um with an addictive he's got an addictive personality um and so that ties into his his idea of the maybe he's imagining these things or maybe he's actually brought these little creatures back with him and um yeah it becomes a part of the story yes yeah and 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 I love the ambiguity around all of that but uh and I mean there's there's ambiguity suddenly a plenty in Mary's life because she's been defining herself as a woman in her own right and now she has to That's go right. back to defining herself by her relationship with her with her husband and how does she how how much of a struggle is that for her yeah I think it's quite um it's quite difficult for her Uh, like it would be for any of us when we have to rebuild our identity you know especially um uh, I think once we become mothers uh that's the first kind of stage of um sort of reinvention and then uh, it, it gets easier after that I think but um certainly for Mary um she she really struggles because she doesn't love him um, and it's she's a very passionate kind of person. Um, but she, luckily she has um, a friend, Richard, who is um, Gulliver's cousin and he is mm. in the original Gulliver's Travels, um, but only referred to a couple of times. He's, again, a marginalised character. And so, um, so Mary at least has that support, I think. Um, and I think it would have been really important to have friends um, in that time because things were so bleak and so dark and you could yeah. wake up with a sore throat in the morning and be dead by the evening. Um, so life was very fragile. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it certainly was. It certainly was. Um, and you really get a sense of that when you're reading uh, the book that's absolutely uh, soaked in, in this atmosphere of what London must have been like at the time. Um, uh, which brings me to Bess because one of my favourite scenes in the book is when Bess runs away by herself and, and uh, sort of runs into these prostitutes. Yes. Um, and <laughs> goes wondering that. where she shouldn't. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah, but Bess is um, a terrific character uh, and I particularly enjoyed reading about her because I am the mother of a teenage girl and uh, so is Mary. Uh, and Mary's daughter, Bess, while Mary might not love Gulliver, Bess thinks he's the bee's knees. Uh, right. And she thinks she, she, she fantasizes, she hero worships him and she fantasizes about running away to sea with him. Uh, and I really felt the sting um, that that must have caused Mary, who's doing mm. everything for this headstrong teenager who like teenagers throughout time thinks she knows everything <laughs> yeah I don't think that would have changed too much. <laughs> yeah, some things never change that's uh, right so why why did you why did you decide to set up that dynamic and tell us a little bit about Bess's character and her role in the story Mm, she um Bess came to me quite early on and I didn't really want to tell her story but she just wouldn't leave me alone it was one of those things you know where you've just got to follow the intuition of the story yes. um I wanted to set her up as almost a, a young Mary but a Mary that has that has the opportunity to make choices whereas Mary is quite stuck when she marries girl she doesn't really have a, a lot of options because her father is going blind and they're quite poor and her mother's passed away mm -hmm. um and so for Bess, um, Bess is a child of the 1700s. You know, she's a turn of, a turn of the century child and she thinks that uh, things are going to change. Um, and her father, for whatever reason, negligence maybe, uh, lets her believe that um, she's going to be able to join him and they're going to go to sea together. And he tells her all these tales, tall tales, because that's what he does. He yeah. tells stories. Um whether true or not and uh, so poor Bess gets sucked into this idea this vision of herself going to sea uh, and it's never going to happen and Mary um, and being a mother myself I know this sometimes you don't want to hurt um, you don't want to hurt your child by um, telling them the truth about things and so you just let things slide and you hope that things will get better um, but in Mary's case uh, with Bess that's that doesn't happen. And so when Gulliver comes back, um, Mary is faced with telling Bess the ugly truth, uh, which is, I think, something that we can all identify with who have children. Yes. Um, yes. And and poor Bess. I have a daughter too, and she's six, going on 16. So I used a lot of that <laughs> as inspiration for Bess's character. Um, but she's, yeah, she has a, a strong mother as well. So she has a strong role model and part of the story is that um, the theme of the story is this finding your way home to um, to the person that you you need to be and, and to the the parental figure that um, that you need to actually follow. Yeah, uh, and and be with. But it's you know I found I, I found um, Bess's journey and development really fascinating and so well written. And going back to that scene that I mentioned before when she wanders down to the docks and. Basically, she she strays where she shouldn't, gets the shock of the yes. life, gets this, yep. gets a tiny yep. bit of sense scared into it. Uh, tell us yep. about that. Yeah, so um, Bess has always been very curious about um, about death, and I think she's sort of inherited that from from Gulliver, but also mm -hmm. from Mary. And so she's always wanted to see a, a body a hanging, and so she wanders down to the docks to see this pirate who's been hung for his crimes. There's a um, a place in Wapping called the Execution Docks, and it's where they used to hang the pirates. And the um, the decree said that the tide had to wash over them three times before they could be cut down. So they probably looked pretty bad by the time that it was <laughs> it was time to cut them down. And um, and Bess wanders down there innocently, thinking that she can she can handle it because she's she's a teenager and she gets there, and you know it's just not at all what she thought it would be. Um, and she does she gets um, a bit. Scared. And then she meets these uh, these prostitutes as well um, and suddenly realises that the docks, which she has always thought of as her father's domain, her father's uh, a safe place in Anchorage, is actually um, full of danger um, and that she could very well be sort of shanghaied off 
with these prostitutes because that's what they used to do. They used to just kidnap you and uh, and then they would trap you and you couldn't uh, leave the brothel. So um, so she's very lucky to to escape that because her mother comes along and rescues her. <laughs> yeah, Mary to the rescue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that I loved um, about this book, as you might have guessed, I loved a lot of things about this book, but one of the things I loved is you've got this tension between birth and death um, that's constantly there and constantly humming along. And, of course, in those days, childbirth was a dangerous practice, um, both for, as you were just telling us, for the midwives as well as for the mothers and the babies. Um, uh is that something that you that that you that you wanted to do? Because for, for me, it was very much there. This constant, you know, just flip the coin or move something half an inch, and you've got yeah. the difference between birth and death. Yeah, I think um, I think definitely um, it's. I think we forget that even though we live in modern times, you know, um, birth is still incredibly dangerous. Yep. Um, and things go wrong, um, and it is kind of a miracle when babies are. Are born um, and I'm sure that I when I was doing the research and I asked my mum you know that was one of the things that she said is that no matter how many times you see it it's still incredible uh, to witness and um, so that was definitely something that I, I tried to keep in my mind I tried to make not to make it too too sad um, because it's it's quite fraught already as a story um, with yes. this sort of tension there's a um, you know, an assailant on the loose and things like that. Yeah. But definitely that um, that knife edge between birth and death was something that I wanted to acknowledge. And I wanted best particularly, I think, to acknowledge it um, because it's part of growing up, isn't it, that you yeah. sort of accept, you know, your own mortality. Um, and definitely for Beth, that's something that she has to come to terms with. Um, and, and that time period as well, as we were saying, was incredibly dangerous um, and they didn't have a vaccine coming for um, no. their, no, for the smallpox or the plague, you know, they just it wrote it out. Um, any one so of them. it would have been, yeah. yeah, pretty grim, I imagine, a pretty grim time period to uh, to grow up in. When I Before I started doing the research, I had this idea <laughs> of the 17th century being something like a Jane Austen novel. I know, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't until I started doing the real nitty gritty research that I realised how terrible it was and how dangerous and mm. um, and how how bleak uh, and it was you know and how much of a miracle it would have been to survive um, yes. your first sort of ten or twelve years. I don't know whether you read um, Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. Hamnet that came out. I haven't. I, I want to. Year. Yeah, want that to was the really. Um, I mean, it only came out earlier this year as well. But when I read that, I thought, yeah, it was. It, the plague was just, it was just something that they lived with, wasn't it? Yeah. It was nothing, yeah, nothing you could do about. Um, there was no no, right. no mask, there were no, there was no prevention of it. It was just yeah, the luck of the draw, really. So, And with things like antibiotics before that, and yeah. you could cut could kill you, you know. Exactly. That sort yeah. of thing, yeah. No, it's a, and, I mean, you do an amazing job of we see the bleakness and we feel the bleakness, but we also see the hope and we see... Um, the agency that Mary has, uh, mm -hmm. and that's so important when you're writing about historical women. I think for them to yes, have, as you would know, agency, yeah, <laughs> uh, as 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 characters, and you do that really well. And it's sometimes really hard, you know, to to give agency to historical female characters and make it plausible. Um, yes, at the same true. time. Uh, yeah. And you've done that's that really true. well. Yeah. Um, but before before oh, I go you. on to the sort of next subject, I just want to briefly ask you as well about Mary's other child, because while Bess, like her father, enjoys consuming all the oxygen in the room, <laughs> there is actually another one too. Tell yeah. us about Johnny. So Johnny is um, Bess's brother, Mary's youngest child. Um, he doesn't play a huge role in the story, but um, I wanted him to be there because he... Um, he sort of represents this uh, this masculinity that Mary is trying to um, to shift this idea of him being a little man, which is uh, the kind of thing that his father, that Lemuel sort of in, tries to instill in him, this idea of being a man, being a tough guy, you know, a sailor, you tell stories and you um, buckle up and you go to sea. Yeah. Uh, but 
uh, Johnny is his own person too and he is at school um, and part of Mary's um, uh, realisations that, um, you know, the school that she thinks that he's safe at is actually not that safe at all and um, that he's being harassed and bullied and potentially um, assaulted, um, which I think happened a lot as well during that time period. Um, And even now, you know, you you hear about these hazing stories at these grammar schools um, and they seem like such safe havens, but they're really not. Um, So, yeah, one of Mary's um, uh, things that she has to deal with is that she has to... uh, to uncover the truth about uh, about Johnny's stories as well. It's all about yeah. truth telling, really, and and working out what's real and what's not. I think. Yeah. 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 No, he's 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 a he's a great character too. And there is another character, and we were talking before about the danger um, that was basically around every corner during that period. Now there is a specific danger in the form of one person when it comes to Mary. Uh, are, are you comfortable talking about that? Um, yeah, I mean, he he's the the real danger, I suppose, of the story. His name's Piet Willems, and he's a character from the original Gulliver's Travels as well. He um, is the character who supports Lemuel's stories um, when Lemuel gets picked up um, from Lilliput or from the island, wherever the island is, um, and he's the one that justifies um, Lemuel's presence to the captain so that the captain's thinking of chucking him back out of the boat. Um, and Piet is the one that sticks up for him. So they have this really kind of interesting um, dependency. Um, mm-hmm. So I wanted to put that in there as well, um, that, you know, there are these um, male friendships that sometimes um, develop out of sort of bad habits and egging each other on. And um, so Piet Williams is one of those characters um not a very nice character um and also sort of um mary is a gardener and she loves to dig up weeds and piet is basically the big weed of the character of the out of all the characters he's the one that sort of puts his gets his tendrils into the household and then refuses to leave so it becomes very important for mary to um to figure out that he is sort of as this very bad influence and and try and extract him but of course it's too late by then not so easy to do yes because he's got his little roots sort yes, of down under the kitchen table <laughs> <It's written. That's laughs> no he's and i mean that, that that there's a real sense of menace in the way you write about him a real sense of quiet menace yes. um uh which which i loved but uh, i mean one of the great things about the book is that it's so um uh, so wonderfully well researched. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you researched and how you went about uh, sort of rooting yourself in that particular time and stepping through the wormhole into the yeah. sights and the smells and the sounds? Yeah, sure. Well, I told you that I um, initially thought that it would be like a Jane Austen novel. <laughs> it turned out to be not not so much like that, although that was also a brutal time period. I think it was just mm-hmm. a veneer of it. Um, you know, it looks so lovely, but uh, it's not really... Um, I started by reading a lot as much as I could. I read a lot of books about Restoration London, um, which is the period after um, Charles II was restored to the throne. His father, Charles I, had his head cut off um, and then they had the interdurum, I think it's called, um, where Oliver Cromwell was in charge, um, Parliament was in charge. And then in the 1670s, 1680s, Charles II became the king of England. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the 1690s, which almost brings you up to when Gulliver's uh, wife is set, um, it became, it was the Dutch king, King uh, William of Orange, and he married Mary. Um, and so they they were the king and queen at that time period. And then after them was Queen Anne. So Queen Anne is when the story set, she is the monarch of the time period. Um, and that's kind of an interesting period because she... Uh, Queen Anne herself had 17 children Um, and so I thought there was kind of an echo of this tragic loss um, in that even though from the monarch down you know she um, had I don't know whether you've seen what's the movie called the favorite the favorite Favorite. yeah an amazing movie right so Coleman's incredible (laughs) amazing yeah yeah Um, and very tragic story that she lost all 17 of her children and went sort of mad um, so that's the time period that it's really set in. So I read a lot of um, books about her. I also travelled to England, travelled to London, and I travelled to Ireland. Um, 
I wanted to, I didn't put a lot of um, Swift in the story, but I wanted to read a lot about his background. So I read his, um, the biographies of him, some really good ones. And I went to um, the church. So it was, tr yes. it was Trinity, I think. Trinity College, Dublin. Trinity yeah. College, yeah, where he was the dean. dean yep. of was he? Yep. And then um, he was also, he's also buried at St. Patrick's. I can't remember the, the church exactly, but so I went to visit his grave as well um, and the grave of his lover, his girlfriend, whose name was Esther, and they're buried side by side. And he called her his star, his Stella. So he's just a really interesting, uh, like amazing writer as well. He cared a lot about the poor. Um, he did a lot of sort of charity work. He left his um, money and his estate to the um, the asylum for the people that needed um, help. Uh, he had tinnitus, I think, which was really? a, I thought was, a, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, ringing in so the he, ear ringing in the ear. So he was very um, aware of madness and how people who were different had maybe mental illness would be, were perceived and were not accepted by society. So he really cared a lot about that, um, mm -hmm. which is, I think, another interesting aspect to the story. Um, when I went to London, I travelled around um, all the places that I thought that I would want to set the book. Um, mm -hmm. Wapping is the place that uh, the Gulliver's House, the Needle, is. Um, it's a very not. It was not a very salubrious area <laughs> in the 1700s. It was um, there was a lot of dock workers there because it was right on the wharves, and so uh, there was a lot of crime. There was a place called the Ratcliffe Highway, which was just on the back of. Um, Whopping, and that was where all the highwaymen, as yeah, you would know, all the highwaymen and the highway women would um, grab you as you were coming out from the pub, the inn, um, drunk, and then you would find yourself, you know, Shanghai or somewhere else on a on a ship or with no clothes on or yeah. whatever the case may be, or you know, you have your throat cut. So it was not a very nice place, um, but it's beautiful now. <laughs> it's all very gentrified now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I did a lot of research around there and there was a really great library that I um, found on the last day of my research trip. I thought, oh, I should really go and see if they have any maps of the area, thinking oh, they're not going to have anything. And it's the Tower Hamlets um, Library. So I turned up and I said, you don't have any. And she said, oh, yeah, we've got heaps of them. And they just pulled them out, you know, and wow. 1768 maps huge um and they're all sort of laminated and so it was great because you could see exactly i could see exactly where the house would have been and where there was all the orchards and um the swamps because it was all around a swampy area that they drained um and there was some really interesting kind of characters as well from the time period there was um there were hermits you know um hermits that uh lived alone and they would live in these little cells next to the church um and they always picked a place near the church so that they could get fed because you know they, they needed alms they had no yeah. no money and no money to buy food um and also there were some really interesting um little locations around the around whopping like pelican stairs frying pan stairs anything like that i just thought yeah. amazing names and you know they sort of had to go in the story um, and the last place I visited was a place called Dennis Sever's house. Uh, it's this incredible live, um, they call it a living museum. And when you go in, you can't take photos. You're not allowed to have your camera on. Mm. I don't know if you've been there, Meg. Have you been I there? No. It's in um, Spitalfields, like right. East London. And uh, it's, you only go there, you have to go there after dark. So it opens at five and you've got um, 10 minutes. So you walk in and it's all lit up like it's, the 1600s wow and it, it was just like that's the best thing isn't that if Absolutely. you could just have one of those for every book oh <laughs> it I, know. So convenient. I know it I was know. yeah all candlelight no sounds you know um and you could see what the light was like because the light's really important um there's no electric lights or lanterns or anything like that so it was all candles and um and the smells too just the mm. the natural smells of a place the um the tallow that fat tallow yeah. and the oranges and the cinnamon so yes yeah, that was yeah. Great. and I mean it's um it's so important isn't it when you're evoking a historical time pe time period to have all of the senses covered off yes um yes, exactly. so that you can really help people um 
uh, help people step through the wormhole into that into that time. So That's what right. I might do is ask people, if you've got questions for Lauren, just before I ask the next question, now's probably a good time to start uh, popping them uh, in the chat box. Um, uh, and we'll get to them as soon as Lauren has uh, answered the next question, which is, tell us about what you're working on now. Um, what am I working on now? I am right in the middle of <laughs> my next book, which is proving to be a real hard chestnut to crack. But I think they're all like that at this point. Yeah. Um, it's the moment of existential crisis isn't it? <laughs> with every novel halfway mark. Um, but it's about uh, a 17th century dress. So a few years ago, I was reading um, The New Yorker and there was an article about um, this beautiful silk dress that was brought up by these Dutch divers. Um, and they were sort of diving illegally and they shouldn't have been, you know, that it's um, the, the UNESCO laws said that you, if you find anything, as Meg would know, because Meg is a scuba diver, to leave it where it lies. And they were very naughty and they brought all this amazing stuff up, but who knows if they had left it there, it might've rotted. Um, it was in a little bag and they unrolled it and it was this incredible, well-preserved silk dress. Um, and so they, um, have been working on it for the last few years and the an article in the New Yorker was all about Texel which is the island where it was found um, where they have a saying which is that the sea gives and you keep it mm. um, so there's that whole thing of um, sort of cultural ownership you know who yes. owns the dress and yeah. there are a suggestion that um, it might have been one of the ladies in waiting to Elizabeth Stewart who was the winter queen um, mm. she was the queen of Bohemia and she was queen for one season only so that's why they call her the winter queen and then she lived in exile at the Hague so my story sort of combines this um the story of a, of a lady's maid who goes to the Hague um after a sort of a tragedy and uh, takes along this dress which she sort of thinks is, is cursed um her sister's dress that she died in and um has to undo this sort of curse that she thinks she's been put under because um, her name is Anna Tessel and her father named her um, Ruin on Texel, uh, which is a true story. There was a woman named <laughs> named Ruin on Texel because um, her father was very religious and there was a big storm and he lost all of his ships. So she's lived with this uh, this curse with her whole life. And so it's about how she um, she finds herself and finds love and, and moves past grief. And then in the um, modern section, it's about a woman called Jo who's dealing with her own uh, demons and her own sort of anxiety. And um, she's a Dutch expat living in Sydney and she gets called back to um, Holland to investigate the origins of this silk dress. And of course, um, has to unpack a lot about herself and her own parents who, who passed away when she was 15 and, and she came to Sydney to move, live with her aunt. So that is the story. So I'm just trying to tie it all together now. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, hurry up, Lauren, because I want to read it. Uh, thank <laughs> come you. On. I, I wish you could write it for me. Can you just come <laughs> and be obliging and give me a hand? <laughs> we can uh, co-author it. You like co-authoring. <laughs> Um, but no, that's that sounds amazing. And um, uh, if anyone has any questions, just pop them uh, in in the chat box. Otherwise, Lauren and I are perfectly capable of rabbiting on all night. Yes, we are. Um, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's interesting that you said that you're at that sort of crunch stage. Uh, with the book and all books have them. Um, yep. What's the process like for you? When do you know, is there some sort of tell that lets you know that you, it's really beginning to gallop along, it's really coming together? Um, I don't know. It's really hard, isn't it? I feel like every um, 30,000 words, it, you hit a point where you want to keep going. Mm -hmm. But some that, yeah, that last, that's sort of last 10,000 between that last section and the next one that's always the bit where I think oh this is not going to work because you have to trust yourself don't you that you have to trust the story that it's going to come together even if you've got the best plan yeah um yeah it's just that moment of truth is this working or is it not um so I think the thing is just to keep going and push through that yeah. anxiety mm, unfortunately <laughs> As you know. Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. Dinaka has a question and um, she says she loves the book and loves the research, but also your Thanks, prose Dineka. and descriptions. Uh, and she's wondering what your advice is for historical, aspiring historical fiction writers in terms of evoking a particular time and place. 
Um, I think it's um, it's all about the research, isn't it? To um, to really get that sense, um, you really have to write, read until you feel confident, until you have that authority over the voice, uh, because each time period is going to have its own kind of atmosphere and its own zeitgeist and its own um, yeah, and its own the voice of the story. So the voice of the story to me has to come through. Um, and if it's not coming through, then I think I have to more research to do. So um, it's almost like being blocked. You know, that moment where you think, oh, I can't do this. It's not working. I always go back to the research um, and I find something in the research. And I think that's right. I was going to write about that. I was going to write that um, idea into it. So a lot, a lot of the time for me, it's just that I forget. <laughs> Yeah. My head is like a colander and oh, yeah. I'm thinking about so many things. I forget, oh, that's what I was going to do with that idea. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like, yeah, you retrace your steps, find the right bit of research and then you move onto that path. So, yeah. but it's, it's hard. But I love um, historical fiction. I, I, you know, I'm, I said I'm doing this um, contemporary and historical and the historical sections just come so much easier to me than the contemporary yeah. sections. And I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've tried to write contemporary and it's just not my not my area, so I know exactly. It's hard, what isn't it? Um, All respect to contemporary writing. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, to each his own. Um, uh, Janelle was wondering, um, she says she's intrigued by the details about mid midwifery and was wondering how you researched that. And you already uh, told us a lot about this paper that you found, but was there anything else surprising or any other little rabbit hole that you had to go down in your midwifery research? Um, I, um, this was the book that I really, um, relied on a lot for, um, oh, that's too bright for the midwifery, um, sections. It's called, um, the midwives book or the whole art of midwifery discovered by Jane Sharp. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane Sharp was the first woman to write in English, um, and publish in English, a, um, midwifery journal. Uh, so before that it was all men. Um, like Nicholas Culpepper, he was a herbalist and um, an apothecarist, and he wrote uh, a very knowledgeable knowledgeable text on midwifery, but he'd never seen a birth. Wow. So it was actually um, stories that he got from his sister and his wife. Um, so Jane's version of things was really different, um, and so I tried to use that in the story because I thought it was really illuminating the way that she describes female anatomy you know she'd seen it she'd lived it she knows what those things look like um yeah. so yeah that was really interesting and um another thing that I found very helpful was uh was the book on the 17th century midwives because it um, went into a lot of the other um, sex, the other responsibilities that midwives had. Um, they were called upon if um, a woman was sexually assaulted, they were called upon to give expert um, testimony because they were familiar with female anatomy. Wow. And there was a woman who, um, a true story, which is um, in one of the papers, about a midwife who came to her client's house and he was, and um, the woman's husband was beating her and she was in labour. And it's a really terrible um, story to read. But this midwife stood up to him and she said, um, if you don't desist, I will bring the power of 12 men down upon your head. So she was threatening him um, that she would take him to court, basically. And he did stop and he left um, and the woman gave birth and the, the baby survived. So I just thought that was a really inspiring story. Yes. Um, yeah. And part of the reason why I wanted to write about the midwives um, yeah. and finally the um, the other really interesting thing I thought was about the Chamberlains the Chamberlain family were the people who invented forceps or they said that they invented the forceps um, but they kept it a secret for 30 40 years until they decided to sell the patent and, and collect the money from it um, and during that time they wouldn't let anyone else um, see it so they used to cover the woman's um, eyes they used to blindfold her and they would tinkle bells in her ear to confuse her I don't know how you could <laughs> miss what was happening down there because it must have been so horrific um but they didn't want um they didn't want the women to see what they were up to and then wow. uh, you know tell all their competitors and things like that and wow. there was a story about one man um they made a, a tunnel of sheets and he had to crawl through the sheets to get to the poor woman who was giving birth because he wasn't allowed to see what was going on and he had to fumble around in the dark 
I don't know how anything ever happened. I don't know how babies ever made it. Yeah. Um, but I thought they were just incredible stories, um, which said a lot about uh, about women's agency at the time, and that they were, you know, they were surgical subjects um, at these uh, junctures. Um, and but the midwives saw them as people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Real people. Um, and Amy's wondering if you had any input into the cover, which is just a gorgeous cover, I have to say. Oh, I it, it is nice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I didn't have any say in the cover, um, but I loved it. So that's always good. It's always good when they give you a cover that you actually like, isn't it? <laughs> the one that they um, we actually decided on before that one um, came out was a lot more Dutch and it looked like a Rachel Roosh um, painting, but the man who owned the copyright didn't want it to be broken up. No. So they picked um, those ones instead. But I think those are lovely because they're orchids, tulips, um, tulips, and tulips are connected to the story. Um, they're sort of these um, this symbol for growth and spring and change. Um, so I think that's quite nice that they're on the cover yeah. there. Yeah. Speaking of tulips, one of the attendees wants to know if you've ever tried eating a tulip yourself. <laughs> No, I haven't. Um, I I did want to, but they can actually be quite poisonous. <laughs> I think it probably would have been okay back in the old days when things were organic, organically yeah. grown, but now with all the pesticides, wouldn't want to risk it. No. Um, but you can actually eat tulips. Yeah. And after the war um, in Holland, uh, when people were starving and there was big famine on, they did eat tulips um, because they had nothing else to, to survive on. So you can actually eat them, but I wouldn't recommend it. No. Um, and uh, we've also got a question about what kind of books you like to read for leisure and what your favourite authors and book titles are. Oh, it's so hard. There's so many because my favourite book is always the one that I'm loving <laughs> at the time. You know. um, what have I read this year? Um, I always go back to um, the Hilary Mantels because I think they're yeah. just so um, detailed and I love the descriptions of the clothes and, uh, you know, the sights and the smells. They're just amazing sensory feasts I love so it. um I yeah I haven't read the, in the light yet but uh it's another one of those books in my tbr pile have you read it the, oh yeah the latest one yeah I did yeah it was a bit sad <laughs> like I was a bit yeah. sad to say goodbye after all that yes. time um I, I just think he's a fascinating character he's not always likable but I imagine him being a sort of a Don Draper you know character where he's He's caught in this moment of, um, you know, this uh, moment of crisis and he has to make choices and you don't always get to know what your choices, the consequences of your actions. And I remember um, Hilary Mantel saying that in an interview that these people don't, um, they're not thinking about what's going to happen to them. They don't know what's ahead of them. And that's really something that you've got to think about when you're writing historical fiction you, the author, have to um, sort of write yourself out of the story because yeah. those those characters don't know what their fate is going to be, um, yeah. even though we all know what happened ostensibly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's a related question actually there. Another attendee wants to know uh, which authors inspire your writing. So would Hilary Mantel be one of those? Yeah, I would say so. And um, and Geraldine Brooks, you know, I love yes. her work. Um yeah. And who else do I have on my bookshelf? Why do we why do we always forget? <laughs> I know, I know. Like it's really hard, isn't it? Because yeah. you read so much and I do love reading so much. Um Sally Magnuson was a really um interesting she wrote a really interesting book, The Seal Woman's Gift. That was great in the last few years. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Um and your books, Meg, your books are beautiful too. Oh, thank you. But I've just only I only just finished the rest. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, uh, Margaret was uh, interested in that living museum in Spitalfields and was wondering if you oh, could yes. say the name again. Yes, it's Dennis Severs House. It's D E N N I S Severs, like severed hand <laughs> house. Um, and it's amazing. Yeah, if you're going to London, and I know none of us are going anywhere at the moment, but when you eventually get there, it's absolutely worth um, worth it. It's like the best kept secret in London, I, it I think. It like it. I've got yeah. to go. I've got to go. You have to go. Yeah, uh, you love it. Cindy says she loves your work and you have a great imagination, and she would like to know if you need any special permission to use characters from the classics. Good question. Thanks, Cindy. Hi. Um, I did not need any permission to um, 
use those characters because it's been a hundred years and I think copyright generally um, for those classics last a hundred years and then you can use them. So you could write about um, characters from a Jane Austen novel, for example, um, but certainly things from the last 50 years, I would, I'm not sure how it was, but I think you, you'd be in a bit of trouble. So you want to um, definitely stick to characters that are from the quite distant past. <laughs> Um, and uh, Claire has a question for both of us, um, uh, which is, uh, what comes first, the story or the research? So you go first, Lauren. Um, I think for me, it's the story. I think it's the story, um, but then the research ends up informing the story, if that makes sense. So the first thing that I hook on to is always, um, for example, with the dress. I just, I want to know who wore the dress and I want to know what happened to that woman. Um, mm. But then to fi find those things out, it will come from the research. Um, and then as we were talking about as well earlier, you don't want it to be, um, you don't want it to clash with the research. So from in Mary's example, you know, she couldn't get divorced. That was just not an option for her. Um, so there are things that, um, that you have to be aware of. Mm. Yeah, and, and for me, um, I, I, I read a lot of history simply because it's what I enjoy doing and usually the ideas come from uh, something that I've read and I sort of get the, get the bit between my teeth and think, I have to write about this, I have to write about this, uh, and then I do the research and often the story turns out to be different to what I thought it was, uh, but um, I just get so excited about... Um, a little snippet that I've read about a person in history that I just feel I have to gallop off and write about them. Um, and uh, Sam wants to know, uh, is it, uh, are there any locations um, you hope to visit for a future novel? Any locations what, sorry? Uh, yeah, she, she said you were talking about travelling for research and she was wondering oh, yeah. if, if there's anywhere that you want to go to research a future novel. Oh, yeah, I would love to go to Scotland. <laughs> But I need to find a story and Outlander's been done, so I have to, be, I have to come up with something, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, I, and I've been to Paris as well and I'd love to set a story in, in France. <laughs> Who doesn't want to go to France and write about France? Exactly. But, okay. uh, but it's always got to be the story. Well, are you, are you going to go to France? Well, if I, if, if I, if, if you can. If I can. But we can go together, you know. Oh, yeah, we, we should. Because we suffer for our work. I um, know, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Husbands can't say anything when it's research. No, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, but uh, and Michelle is saying she loves the book and was wondering if you had a special interest in textiles, seeing that your first book and your current project involve textiles. Yeah, I do. I actually think textiles are extraordinary. Um, I think they can teach us so much about the past. I was just reading over my notes today. Um, that I interviewed a, uh, a dress historian and she just told me the most amazing stories about, you know, Charles the first shirt. They could see the blood stains on it. Like these, this is like living history, you know? Um, so it's amazing when they're really well preserved. Um, and I'm currently doing a, um, a master's in cultural heritage because that, it is so interesting to me that I just had to take it further. And I just think it's absolutely fascinating that we still have these artifacts that we can um, we can touch and we can see and we can connect to um, it. And yeah, it's like a living history. Um, and so hopefully that will come through in the story when I write about it. I, you know, my, my character is a dress historian or textiles historian. So I want her to be able to um, make those connections. Um, and I remember that the dress historian saying that it's, it's what doesn't, it's what the negative space around the, the object or what we don't know about it that is where we can sort of fit the gaps of, um, of our educated guesses. So that's really fun for historians to, to kind yeah. of imagine. And they're quite happy not to know a lot of the time. They don't expect to know everything about something. Yes. It's guesswork and detective work and they love that, I think. Absolutely. But, yeah, I know what you mean. I get really excited if I'm holding I know you do. a letter <laughs> that's been, you know. That's right. That, yeah. that, that, that was written by somebody who's been dead for a few hundred years. It's, you yeah. know, very, it's very yeah. I'm, I'm a bit nerdy like that. Um, uh, and too. last of all, KG, <laughs> Lee, but uh, not a question, but she says she feels you and Brooks have walked together um, and that your research is amazing. Oh, thank you. That is so kind of you. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I agree your research is amazing and the book is amazing. 
um, and uh, uh, everybody should read it. Um, and it's been lovely talking to you, Lauren. I can oh, see the clock has been to 7.30 and we... They're going to kick us out of the pub. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank but, you so much, Meg. And and I hope that people will go out and read your new book too, The Wreck, which is oh, a gorgeous you. story thank about you. feminism in um yeah in eighteen hundreds. Oh, thank you very much. And and thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, I hope you get a chance to buy and read this this story uh, as you will have heard. It's fascinating, well researched, very atmospheric and well and truly worth your time. So thank, thank you all for coming. Stay safe. Have a good night.